Do I have to say continue? Yep. Yeah. I think you have to accept that I'm recording you. I can't record you in private and re reveal all your secrets to the world. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Today I was speaking to Liz. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi Donna, uh, yeah, my name is Liz or Elizabeth or lots of other ones I won't go into because we'll be here all day. Um, I am, I live in Buckinghamshire now with my partner Ollie and my two scruffy dogs, Izzy and Coco Belly, or Coco Bell, but she's now called Belly, which sounds awful. Um, and I have been a hypnotherapist, I have been a makeup artist in the film industry, I have been a life coach, I've been a fitness instructor, I've done it all. I've done loads and loads and loads of stuff. I've worked in retail most recently for like the last decade or so, but <clears throat> throughout all of that, running through that, my one, my one big passion is writing and I've always written, not professionally, I've always written about everything I've done, like when I had my fitness classes, don't know if I mentioned I was, did that as well. I would write about that, I would like keep a diary. So writing is really where I am. And I got made redundant, <clears throat> let me see, December 2018. And in January, I thought, what am I gonna do? So I decided it's now or never. I've got three children that are all grown up, Dean, Terry and Joe, and my children now have children. So I'm a, I've got children, children, can't say grandchildren joking I've got children children I've got grandchildren so but now really you know I've got the time <clears throat> to focus on what I love so that's what I've started doing and so far I've notched up five which sounds like a lot but it's not I could have done more but since lockdown I I shall openly admit I've just sort of like blocked out really so here we are I'm glad to talk about it and take my mind off the fact that I'm not writing today because I can't it's like I never even wrote any books <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've got five books released now mm. and what was um your most recent one is in the last few days isn't it or is it not uh, quite no it was about May although there were quite a few mm. end of May and there were some TV problems with the Kindle um, where people can download it so then they redid it again so it looks like it only came out in July but yeah it's out now my most recent one and it was right is something you wanted to do from a child <laughs> uh, little plug there uh, yeah it, it it's funny I don't think I ever thought about it of it as a career I don't think I even thought it could be a career it still isn't a career <laughs> Oh, no, really. but I know that I loved it as a child you know as soon as I could hold a pen I have memories of my mum getting cross because all the kids were out playing summer holidays and I was sitting at the desk that we had actually wasn't a desk it was my dad's piano stool and I used to use it as a desk like a real writer and sit there with loads of paper and just write stories after stories. My dad, bless him, used to come home with like old work diaries that, um, you know, they'd just use a few dates. So he'd pull the pages out and then hand me this big pile like that and go, there you go, Shani. And I'd be like, oh, and when I saw these diaries, honestly, because they were like hardback, you know, when things were proper back in the day, um, I used to look at them and think, they look like books that need to be written. So that's what I did. I started writing in them. I didn't publish any of that, obviously. But uh, yeah, so I've always written. I've always loved writing. I did little things, you know, like entered competitions along the way and wrote into magazines as a kid. You know, I don't know if Jackie magazine, I'm sure that was long before your time and the Diana magazine. I used to write in and, and often get the star letter. I was really like proud of myself, but that was only because I made up something so unbelievable and funny that they're like, oh, I'd, I'd get the star prize. I think it was like two pound or something. <laughs> I felt really rich. So it used to spur me on to tell more little lies or I should say stories, tell more little stories <laughs> for money. <laughs> so yeah, but I've, I'm so glad I've eventually finally blown the dust off of 
not writing and actually thought, yeah, I, you know, I've now got the time. I suppose as well, you know, having three kids uh, all of my life, it's never had an opportunity to present itself. I have tried actually, because the memoir that I've just published I, is my second memoir actually. The first memoir is still in production. It's three quarters written and it's just 97. So I've always been writing to write properly along the way. So hopefully I've that one out. Maybe if I pull my finger out, we'll see. <laughs> um, so what made you choose the genre you write in? And then what made you choose to write a memoir? Okay, um, well, I wrote the memoir first. Um, I chose to write the memoir because there were quite a few reasons actually. A lot of bad things happened, a lot of tragedy in my family over a 10 year period um, from 2008 to about 2017, that sort of time. Anyway, my partner Ollie said to me, you should write about this because I can't remember who died first or what, you know? And I'm like, I can't write that. I, I can't actually mentally forget I couldn't write that and he said well you can because you do write he said and you should do it for your children and the day before my daughter had said to me how do you remember what happened mum it's all such a blur and that's when it clicked I thought you know what I am going to write this and I'm going to write it for my poor kids who were young adults when like my sister died my other sister died my brother died my mum died my sister it was ridiculous it was five of them in a really short space of time and <clears throat> Processing grief, don't know if you know or don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's not something you can choose, it sort of takes hold of you and I worried about my children and going forward into adulthood with, you know, with baggage, if you like, that was causing them problems. So I thought if I write about it and they read about it, they can put the jigsaws together and go, oh, okay, and then maybe cry or get it out of their system. So that was my... But I'd also, as well, it's such a complex thing, so I'm really going on, aren't I? No, it's but my sister, my sister had a car accident which left her brain damaged after being in a coma for a long time. And that, the treatment, I'm not going to blame anyone. I'm just going to say, let's say the medical world is not equipped to deal with that. It's not a broken leg that you can, say, put a plaster on. It's like, oh, how do we deal with this? And a lot of the time, incorrectly. Um, so I wanted a, <clears throat> there was a lot of frustration and it went on for six years before she eventually passed. And there was so much frustration with, with us as a family, not getting the right help and support that I wanted to raise awareness. You know, I wanted people to be aware. I wanted to speak out because the frustration, you know, it, it, leaves you feeling very stifled and silent you know I felt sorry for my nieces Amy and Lucy my sister's two daughters they were both early 20s when it happened <clears throat> trying to cope with a tragedy like that and suddenly be the adults having to make all these really important decisions about their mum's welfare which <clears throat> you know it it changed and evolved as she did um so it's quite a complex thing, brain injury, and I wanted to raise awareness to that. I wanted to raise awareness to mental health, which was something that happened to my sister, my other sister, and suicide, which happened, and also alcoholism, which my brother had. There's quite a lot. And as I was writing about it all, you know, I thought, I'm actually writing about universal themes that everyone can relate to, not just me or my children. And I thought, I think I've actually got something more and so it propelled me to carry on really. I thought if I can help people, like maybe not feel so lonely in their grief, maybe appreciate the family that they have because I haven't really got one anymore, you know, and, and it is helping a lot of people now. So that's just a really lovely bonus. Re, I wrote that, I have to tell you the, bit, the other bit of your question, sorry. And then um, I was too scared to, to put it out. I was like, I'm a really private person. Why the hell am I, why? And I didn't even understand myself why I did it. So I, when I'd finished it, I was like, now what? What do I do? So I thought, well, you're a writer now. You've just written a book. You've just written 78,000 words. 
Um, it's with a literary agent because it was at the time. And I thought, carry on writing. So that's when I wrote all the little books, I say, you know, the, the, the other four. I say little books because they're novellas. They're like 22,000 words, that sort of thing. And I thought, if I put them out first, I'll see if people like what I've written. And if I'm a real writer, so I don't think I had much confidence. I don't think a lot of writers don't have, especially in the beginnings in that way. And people did like it. And it gave me the confidence to think, yeah, I am going to publish the memoir. So that happened in May. And that's been the journey of me from 2018, December, end of the world, got made redundant to today. I've now got five little books, which I'm quite proud of. <laughs> That's amazing. And I can't wait to see the reaction to the memoir as well. I imagine it will be uh, pretty awesome. Yeah, it's doing good. I've got quite a lot as well. The response is phenomenal, actually. It's um, the, the reviews that I'm getting are just... I didn't expect it. I don't know what I expected. I don't think I expected anything. I thought people would do this or not want to talk to me or, you know, it's nuts, the thoughts that you have, but the overwhelming response is like laughter and tears. And I didn't think that that would happen to other people because I don't cry. I didn't cry when I wrote it. <clears throat> you know, I wouldn't have been able to write. I was like, oh, good. <laughs> you know, I, I very much had to put myself in a strong mind um, and be able to be focused enough to tell the story. So I put like a wall between me, if you like, like a sheet of glass. So it's like I was watching events unfold, which protected me from the pain of it, but to try and tell it in the way that it happened for the reader. And so when people say they, they cry, I'm like, oh, oh, okay, sorry. But they're like, no, don't be sorry, it's good to cry. I'm like, okay, it's good to cry. <laughs> but they also laugh. I wanted to balance it because it's very dark. Everything that happened is quite dark and it's tragic. And it's like bomb, 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 bomb tragedy. And I couldn't cope with the thought that it was like that. So I balanced it with funny, funny family stuff, light, so that, you know, the scales felt like that. And by putting loads of stupid stuff in it, because I am essentially a stupid person, I, I feel like I've done this. I've made a fairly balanced uh, story. And has anyone contacted you to say that you've actually helped them? Loads, 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 loads. I've got, you know, um, I, I do encourage people, you know, when I people have bought the book or I know people or they've seen it somewhere, I always say to them, please give me feedback. Um, in the beginning, it was like, can you feedback? Because I'm like, you know, I want to know. But now I still want the feedback just to make sure that that person wasn't lying about laughing and crying. They weren't just saying it because they felt sorry for me. Like, you know, oh yeah, tell it made you laugh and cry. It was rubbish, really, you know? So it's like every time you, you want someone else to confirm it. And so many, I think I've got about 181 um, five-star reviews. And oddly, three one-star reviews. <laughs> But they don't say why, although one person did, she said why, and it was because they couldn't download it onto the Kindle, <laughs> because there were those issues, but, and, and it's like, oh, thanks, you know, it's like, but, you know, it's okay, it's all good, but yeah, a lot of people have, have, and a lot of people message me and say, I feel like I know your family, I feel like I'm part of your family, and that's so sweet, it's so, oh, so it's sweet, so talking to people that have read it, what it gives me is it, it keeps my family alive, which is the, the bonus that I never ever thought writing this would give me. It's just wonderful. And what did your kids think? I don't think they have read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't suppose my sons have read it. A, because they're really busy, really, really busy. B, because they're boys. Uh, my daughter read it, but she read the first draft, which was like 10,000 words more rubbish than it is now. So I'm like, please read the second one, read the second, but because she's read the first, but she did say it made her cry. More importantly, my, my niece, my nieces actually, who I actually dedicated it to, my nephew who lost his mum, my nephew Dylan, and my two nieces, Amy and Lucy, who they lost their mum. That's my other sister, Di. She was the one that had the brain damage 
I really wrote it for them to, so, you know, to break the silence. And I think it's affected them a lot. My own children, yes, it's sad for them. It's their aunts and uncles and everything. And, and it did help them, but my niece was just so overwhelmed when I just sent her a copy and hadn't said anything. She just put this like string of sad crying faces on Facebook and was like, oh my God, uh, yeah, I cannot believe what my auntie has done. When, I, when she opened it and it said for Dylan, Amy and Lucy, it just, and it was tears that needed to happen really, Donna, you know, because we carry it around we don't even realise we're carrying it around. I, I'm the same, you know, grief. You get on with your life, you have to. You put it to one side, you know, you, you just don't realise you're carrying it around. Then something happens like, boom, TNT. So I'm, I'm glad because it's made the girls be able to talk about it, you know, with their friends because their friends now want to read about what happened to them. Maybe their friends and partners will be a bit kinder to them in life, knowing what they've been through. So yeah, as for my boys, 2020, 2029 or something, probably the book it in to be read. <laughs> Better late than never, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite common, I find, especially with boys, so. It's hard, it's very hard to read, isn't it? You know, I find it hard to read. I mean, especially when I'm writing as well. It's like, how the hell do you read and you write? You know, while I'm reading that, I should be writing that. And it's all quite, especially, it's like anything. It's like my fitness class and people go, oh, I'd love to come, but I haven't got the time. And it's like, no, you have, if you want to, you just make the time. And that's really anyone that thinks they haven't got the time, me included, it's, it's not true. You have, make time. I've managed to actually read Matt Haig over the last couple of days, that reasons to be alive. I don't know if you've read that. Yeah. <laughs> I, quite, I quite like real books, you know, because my book's real, well, one of them. Uh, my, my main one is real. But, oh, I've got something to share with you, actually. I got mm -hmm. to see this. I found out today that I'm in here. In awesome. books of the month, with my little one out of three, that's me. Hertfordshire Life magazine. Oh, you're in Bedfordshire. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> it's close. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It is, it is. So that was nice. It's good, so I'm really pleased. <laughs> and how has the reaction to your fiction books been? Your little books? <laughs> Well, that was so good, my little books. Here they are. They are little. Look, look at this. I'll show you. Look how... Look, my Blimey. iPhone is actually thicker. <laughs> and, uh, the reason for that is, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to self-publish, that's my self-publish. It's come out like a pamphlet. It's supposed to be actually this size. Second time round with the sequel, I got it, I got it right size. <laughs> All those self-publishing, KDP, that. Um, but yeah, aside from what they look like, my pamphlet, which was my first, my first little self-published book, I had such a lovely response. People were like, oh my God, I love it, I love it, I love it. And I thought, wow, wait till you read the big one then if you like that one. So the response has been really good. And because of the response to, to my pamphlet, my first, <laughs> my pamphlet, you can read it in five minutes, really easy. Cheating really, mm -hmm. writing novellas, it's because I'm impatient. Honestly, I, I don't think I can sit and write a novel. I don't think I've got the patience. But because of them, they're like, we want to know what happened to the boys. So I had to write this, which is the follow on. So that was really good. That gives closure to that. And then, of course, I've got the other two, which this one, this is a little cosy crime thing. Those are whatever they are. I can't remember now. Tragedy, because I'm just so tragic. And this is comedy. Ooh comedy very hard very hard to do but I've got this I want to write as many genres as I can before I go to my grave like a bowl of sweets to be able to give people <laughs> yeah I mean I imagine your own memoir is probably the hardest so everything else after that in theory should be easier I guess 
God, yeah, yeah. I mean, that takes some, you know, that's something else. It's just ironic that I wrote that first. It seems so funny. And then they, I mean, I think each one of those just took just a couple of months, really. But this, you know, with the memoir, just, it's so important to be right. I feel like because it's real, it's so important to be right. And it's so important to think, you know, am I got all my facts straight as well, you know, because I'm told quite frankly about what I think about mental health issues and, um, you know, the medical health profession and antidepressants and how they love to dish them out, you know, which is bad, in my opinion. I, I'm not saying some people don't need them and they don't help some people, of course, and I'm sure, but, you know, my opinion of antidepressants is in there. So that's quite a scary one, really. And I was a bit scared and I thought, oh, I might get some backlash, but I haven't. So far, all I've just had is loveliness and it's helping people. In fact, one lady messaged me, you saying about people contact me and said, um, after reading your book, I'm going to stop taking my antidepressants. And I was like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> well, don't do it. Don't do it like that. Because you can't just stop taking them, can you? You've got to wean off. I said, please go to the doctor. So she said she would. And she's conquered it, bless her. She let me know. And she actually feels better now that she's stopped. I'm not saying that's for everyone. You know, I don't want to be like a bad advocate for antidepressants. Just that worked for her. That helped her. So that I'm pleased about. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots and lots of your your family was so close. This is one I never expected. You know, she said, "I've got six siblings. I'm one of seven, like you were." And I was like, oh, "Okay." She said, "But none of us are close, and we don't talk, and we all live." And she said, "Just I wish I'd had that closeness. Be grateful for what you had." And it was like, "Wow, that's turned my misery on its head." You know, there's me being sad about the loss, but it is. A cliche true better to have loved and lost than never had it you know then there are other people that have said I really appreciate my family I went straight out and um, bought my sister a, a like a present and took it around and she's like what's wrong with you she's like I just I love you you know so it's nice to know it is nice to help that is a bonus and I think that inadvertently has been helping me as well um, which is a really funny thing, and I, I, I didn't expect it to happen. So good, so good. Yeah, that's lovely. And then you get to see your little grandchildren grow up now, and then you've got a family starting all over. <laughs> that's it. I've got children, children. It's funny, I, and I write children, children. That's a good one, isn't it? I um I do write about that in there. You know, at some point, it's just it's life, it's evolution. You know, the the old people that are all dying off, the new ones are coming in. There's something wonderful actually. This is another thing that my partner said to me in the the depths of my grief, which I did have for a long, long time. I was very, very depressed. Um, he said, Liz, you know, he said we're all on the same bus and we're all going to the same party. And he said, don't you think you owe it to those that, you've, that we've loved and lost to enjoy your time on the bus instead of feeling sad all the time? It's the silliest sentence he's ever said to me, and it went ding. It was like, honestly like a light bulb. I thought, oh, my God, we are. We're all on the same bus. We're all, it's not a surprise. People die. It's not a surprise. Your parents are going to die. Yeah, that's, that's the way it goes. That's where it's meant to go. Um, and it's the one thing that so many people in a, probably like a 25% of my reviews, people have mentioned that on the bus saying it's become a thing now. It's just helped a lot of people. It's like, wow, I'm so glad I bothered to write. I nearly didn't write that in because I thought it sounds a bit silly, but it worked for me. It worked for me. And, you know, I remember it and in my darkest moments or in my darkest moments, I just used to think about that. I used to think, yeah, we're all on the same bus. You know, some countries celebrate death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I wouldn't a good go that far. No. I wouldn't go that far. But, 
but just to, you know, I mean, it doesn't stop grief. I know, you know, when your mum dies, your dad dies, that I lost my brothers and sisters, you know, my mum didn't even get a look in, she died in that, you know, in my memoir, my, my sister died first. Um, and two months later, my mum died. It was like two months after my sister, but we were so in shock about my sister's tragic death. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say too too much because I don't want to like upset people, you know, because there are people that don't want to read this, really. I mean, those that have read it, that are like, oh, I'm a bit scared, but I'm going to read it, have enjoyed it. But there are some people that have said, I'm too scared to read your book. And I go, don't read it. If you feel like that, if you're scared of the subject of the word suicide, don't read it. You know, but for some people, it's a needed thing. But my sister did take her own life. That's how it all started. And two months, that was hard to process. And two months after that, my mum died. So that was the, the worst bit, really. <clears throat> the nucleus of the tragedy, which included my other sister having a brain damage, my other sister dying from emphysema, my brother dying from alcoholism. All of that happens like this in a like little period of time. But the, the nucleus bit was my sister taking her own life. And then two months later, my mum dying. We were so upset and in shock about my big sister taking her own life. But when they said my mum had a brain tumour, I just went, oh, oh, okay. Like, I, that was, the nurse looked at me and my sister like we were like really rude. She went, you'll have to get your own dinner tonight, I'm afraid of me and my sister were like, oh my God, you don't understand. It, it really does make you realise, you know, it puts you, Grief puts you in such a lonely place. You know, it's such a lonely place. I still carried on working. Me, me and my sister were the last two remaining. My brother's still here, by the way. Sorry, I didn't mean that, Dave. But my sister were the last two remaining sisters until she eventually died. But we used to, um, you know, her way of coping was moping. And it used to really bring me down. And I understand why she was moping now. Now that she's gone and towards the end before she died, I understand why she couldn't get out of her dressing gown. You know, it's okay to not be okay. I understand all that now. I wished I'd understood everything before and that you didn't have to go for all these things to understand people's pain. But I used to get annoyed with her because my way of coping was going to work, going to all my shops, retail, dealing with people and I had all this stuff going on in my head I had all these deaths and all this tragedy going on and I would go into a shop and say talk to like a shop worker in there and say oh you know I just come to check how if the deodorants come in for L'Oreal's new brand, um, product you know and she'd go oh god oh, I feel awful today and I go oh are you okay and she'd go oh my chrysanthemums all blew over in last night's wind and I'd be like my sister's in a coma. My sister's in a coma. How do you think she, she can't eat, you know, she can't move and you're worried about your chrysanthemums. It's very isolating because you, you can't go, oh yeah, well, my sister's in a coma or you don't want to. <laughs> so, but then that made me sympathize with people and think, wow, if you're upset about your chrysanthemums, how are you gonna cope? you know, when bad things happen. So, and this is really one of the reasons that propelled me to write the book so people can like learn and learn to, you know, or at least be prepared, you know, that somehow, if it's even possible to be prepared, I don't think it is. No, I don't think so. Um, it's interesting talking about suicide because I think it's uh, Suicide Prevention Day today. So right. it's... Yeah very good timing I guess if there is such a thing <laughs> yeah well I so, never knew that. I never knew that and um, I'm, I am really glad to be part of something that's because you know what I've written was not that long ago fairly taboo but now you know mental health is a thing you know Kate isn't it Kate and um, William I think they champion like mental health issues and things like that and you know it's just it's got so much stigma around it that shouldn't be there. Mental health varies from I'm a little bit down to I can't get out of bed, you know, or I'm a bit miserable, you know, the, the umbrella of mental health, you know, but it's really good that people are coming out and talking now and that they're doing things like this suicide awareness because I felt like 
a freak when my sister did that, when she took her own life. I felt like a freak, and I'll admit it, and I felt ashamed of her. Um, and that's really horrible to admit, but that's the truth. I felt, I felt ashamed of myself being associated, and I couldn't talk about it, which was why I surprised myself that I could even write it. But I've grown and learned so much, and as awful as it sounds to say, feeling supported by things. You know, when Robin Williams took, took his own life, it was in the same way as what my sister did. I felt comforted. In that I didn't, don't mean I'm glad he did that, but I felt comforted. I was like, oh, it's not just you. It's him as well. And he was, you know, my sister had a really good job. She was very well known in, in her industry, in the film industry. Um, not famous, but she was famous within the industry, you know, crew members and... Likewise, big directors and film producers that knew her, so it was a shock. So when Robin Williams did that, felt some sort of comfort by it that you don't have to be mad to do something like that. It doesn't mean you're crazy, you know? It just means, wow, you can feel so bad. That's, that's the scary thing, that someone can feel so bad that there's no, no other way out. And that there, there is a way out, and it's called asking for help and it's called talking about it. And all this raising awareness is fantastic because it, there's probably a lot of people now that wouldn't have talked about it that might have taken that extra step like Matt Haig says in his wonderful book. If he'd just taken that one more step, he'd have gone off the edge of the cliff, but he, he took the step back and I, I sort of made me think, wow, yeah, my sister took that extra step. Lots of people took that extra step. But, there's lots of people now, if we all talk about it and raise awareness to it, that might not take that extra step. So that's a good thing. And that's what I want my book to do as well. Yeah, um, definitely. I, I've, had, I've had people that have attempted but never gone through, thankfully. But it's horrendous. And, you know, they trust you to speak to you. And yet, you're like, oh my God, this is such a, I don't know what to say really, but just listening, I think is, is all I figured. When I was in that situation, yeah. they didn't want me to say anything. They didn't want platitudes, they didn't want anything. They just wanted someone to talk to. And yeah, and I think that's so important. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. You're um, absolutely right, You're absolutely right. Don. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Um, as I said, there's another author um, bringing out his memoir of mental health soon called David Mark, and I think he attempted suicide. I haven't read it yet, but it seems um, that people feel more comfortable now releasing their stories, and um, it's more common than anyone could possibly have known. It so is. This is why. This is why I. I. I would. I say brave because I do consider myself brave because I am actually a private person and I felt so depressed and so um, for a long period of time and lonely. And you're so right what you were saying about your friends, just to go back to that. Um, there's nothing you can say that will make them feel better. That's the trouble, but they need to air it. And I know because I've been in that place um, where I've, where my partner was obviously tried to say all the right things, you know, it will get better. You were, and in your brain just says it won't. Oh, there'll be a light at the end. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, you just time will be a healer. Shut up. You know, all the cliches. They're true. Time is a healer, actually, because you you build your life around it, and it just becomes less and less important in your life. But there's nothing you can say to someone that's suffering in that way, like you say that will probably, I don't mean to be horrible, but will possibly make them feel worse. So you're really good to just be a pair of ears and know that you, also, it's not good to not say anything because that's even more like when people look at you weirdly like that. You know, I've told people one day I actually did do that, you know, in the height of it all when my sister had had a crash and then nine months later, my sister took her life and then two months later my mum died I was living that all in the space of like nine months I was just so like an umbrella of like weight all on my shoulders but I still went to work because that was my coping mechanism just forget it ignore it it's not happening um 
And one lady told me that her mum had died or something. And I just was in that mood that day where I said, well, my sister, and like, da, da, da. my sister had a car crash. She was in a coma. She's like, now she's got brain damage. Now she can't walk. She can't eat. Uh, but she's awake enough she's to not be a vegetable so she can talk. And I just, with all this stuff, it all came out. And my, my sister, then she she hanged herself. And then two months later, my mum, and this poor, poor person went, <laughs> that, I went, anyway, catch you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I ruined her day for sure but I felt like it that day but it's like how do you put that in a book and then expect all these people to read it without feeling like a weirdo but you know me talking about it myself stops me feeling like a weirdo has stopped me I should look out for that book I'll ask you after what that that guy that book that's coming out because I'd be really interested to read it yeah I can't in a way I can't wait to read it um he's a lovely guy so um yeah it'll be interesting to see his journey but yeah he's um he run a kickstarter campaign to get it out there I think and he's trying to get support from celebrities so it's really important to him yeah you know, I, didn't know about things. I didn't know about that because I'm just so un au fait with internets and things do you know what i've just heard though do you, are you on tiktok yeah although i don't understand it at all <laughs> are you on tiktok yeah mm -hmm. i read this yesterday saying like book talk you know get get your book out to millions i was like oh no <laughs> i've just like got my head around instagram and i haven't got my head around it. Instagram and now I've got to look at TikTok anyway I went on TikTok I tell you my head nearly exploded I was like I can't I, I cannot I think I'd rather dig a hole in the garden <laughs> get in it now and fill it in he goes you know what <laughs> if this is what I've got to do to sell my books I'm not gonna sell them yep don't it's ask sad. me I, I have no clue this is for the you youth know, it, it is, isn't it? But now it's like seeming, I don't know if I believe it, you know, and I'd be interested actually if there are anybody listening to me still piffle or they haven't switched off by now. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see if there's anyone else out there, any other writers that have had any experience with TikTok, because I'd be interested to know. I mean, I think we all have our preferred thing. I love Facebook. Um, I know what I'm doing with Facebook. I feel at home with Facebook and it's been good to me. You know, and actually one, one publisher lady said to me that was going to publish my book, but I didn't go with them in the end. She said, um, don't worry about it, because I was like, oh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, you know, Goodreads. She said, Liz, just Twitter. That's another thing I'm no good at, Twitter. I wish I was. I know loads of people are, but I just don't get it. I can't see the point. But, <laughs> but she said to me, you'll have one, one preferred um, What's the word? Social media. Should you have one preferred social media source? And that is your one. And that's the only one you need to worry about. And I was like, hallelujah. Now I feel like I can look at TikTok and Instagram and not care so much if it doesn't work out for me. <laughs> and, and be a twit or whatever they call them. <laughs> the trouble with doing what I do is that I kind of need to be seen on all of them. So I have to learn how to use them. But TikTok has uh, eluded me so far. I have no clue. I signed up and I've just looked on. <laughs> nah. Same, same. I went in a bad mood with my brain jaded from videos that kept popping up. There is a course, actually. I might try and find it. It's a free course. It popped up in my feed. Um, a free course on the 15th of September. It's like an hour thing, just how to get your head around TikTok. And it's free, I don't know if that's of any use to you. Yeah. Or anyone else listening that's going, yeah. oh, book talk. Book talk seems to be the thing now. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is the world coming to, eh? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's much easier before the internet. <laughs> Love hate. Yeah. I am... Um went to uni and I had all my colleagues were young they were like 20 and they genuinely asked me how I used to do homework before the internet <laughs> so, how do you think really? <laughs> yeah. oh god I never felt so 
Did you did you show them that? Did you show them? <laughs> this thing, right? It's got wet liquid inside, and what happens is, oh my god! Yeah, and libraries and books and things like how do you think <laughs> how else would we do it oh, yeah. there's nothing like younger people making you feel old is it I remember when I, I bought an old um, record player not not that long ago my, I say not that long ago it's probably a decade ago because that to me is not that long ago now <laughs> at my age um yeah I bought a record player my daughter who's like about 20 something then she was like, oh, that looks exciting. And I said, yeah, it's a record player. And I said, you know all my records in the loft? We got, and she went, yeah. And she goes, how does it work? She went up to the record player. She lifted the needle and she went, I thought she was going to blow dust off it so that she could play a record. No, she went, hello, hello, <laughs> one, two, three, <laughs> testing. I was like, what are you doing? Stop it. I feel really ancient right now. <laughs> She'll hate me for that, by the way. I hope she's watching. <laughs> Have you seen a video of young lads or young kids trying to figure out how a tape works? Like they literally, they hold it up to their ear and they're looking at all the, oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh. yeah, that was quite depressing. They have no clue, absolutely no clue how they'd possibly get music from this tape. <laughs> oh, do you know, I am actually glad I was born in the era that I was, that I know that I all those things in life. Although maybe again, on that said, it'd be easier for them because they're all just going to be internet sensations, aren't they? Famous on TikTok and whatever they do. I mean, my granddaughter's on TikTok. She's on Instagram, makes me like go, oh, what are you doing? But you know, it's what they do. <laughs> it's what they do. So yeah, maybe maybe we know, we know too much, don't we? Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I don't think I have any more questions for you unless there's anything else you want to tell us about oh do you know I'd sit my off all day so I don't have to do any washing up or anything but no, no that's, that's lovely if you haven't bought it anyone if anyone cares buy this because it's a good cause or buy it for someone that you know that might be upset am I allowed to do that a plug yeah absolutely and remind everyone where they can find out more about you Oh, um, Elizabeth Coffee, not as in the drink. This is, my, this is my name. It's not, my name is not Elizabeth Coffee. My name's Elizabeth Coffee, not as in the drink. <laughs> so C-O-F-F-E-Y. Um, I'm on Facebook, Elizabeth Coffee Writer, Instagram, whatever. My name is on that, Elizabeth Coffee Writer. I a TikTok person. Um, Elizabeth Coffee Writer, no surprises yet. And I mean, really, if you put the title of my latest book or any of them, and the little one said, and my name in Google, it just comes up with the Amazon author bio. And on my author bio, it's got all the social media links. Because I do like talking to people, actually, and I love the messages and they keep me going. And um, feedback is, uh, is a wonderful thing. Talking is a wonderful thing. It's a very needed and healing thing and long may it continue so yeah anyone please message me if you want i am here <laughs> brilliant well thank you very much thank you it's been lovely chatting to you today sun's come out now here and the same <laughs>